Nice to uh, meet those of you I haven't met before. And thank you so much to those of you whose cameras are on. I appreciate that not everyone can have their camera on, but for those of you who've had the last year long experience of communicating over Zoom, there's something about speaking into the void when no one is on their camera. That's a little bit disconcerting. So even just to see a few faces is very appreciated. So thank you for being there. But thank you all of you for being there. So um, as Joanne mentioned, I didn't have an enormous amount of uh, a heads up about tonight, but I'm going to do my best to at least bring a little bit of um, meaning and insight into this week's parish and something practical that we can kind of take away from this. And as you just said, you know, stepping off the plane from Israel and missing that and telling everybody that that's where we need to be, this week's parasha uh, is very timely. Before I speak about the parasha, the time is now 8.36, and Shia is, I believe, at 9.10. And today is the 23rd of Sivan, and it's actually a very auspicious day, which ends at 9.10. I want to give you this heads up, because even while I'm talking, you can still take advantage of this. The, um, the significance of the day of the 23rd of Sivan is that today is meant to be the day that the um, edict that went out from Haman to annihilate the Jewish people was annulled. And therefore, there is an energy in today of annulment of decrees or uh, negative things in the world that need to be annulled. And there's a whole bunch of things that you can do, but seeing as though we've got limited time, I'll tell you that one of them is uh, Tehillim Kaf Beis, or really just to have an intention that anything that seems to be sort of headed in the wrong direction, it seems like it needs annulling and changing. Today is the day to put uh, Kavana and emphasis into that thing. So just take advantage of the last uh, half an hour at the same time as I'm talking to kind of uh, focus on that idea. And um, specifically also actually to focus on an, uh, the annulment of um, not just individually, but us as a people and where we may currently find ourselves to govern for that as well, that things uh, change direction and that we find safety and peace. Um, okay. So in this week's Parsha, there is the very famous story, which in a lot of ways uh, changes the trajectory of the history of the Jewish people which is the story that we refer to as the story of the Miraglim, the story of the 12 spies who go to scout out the land and come back with uh, very negative reports. So just as a sort of like a brief summary without going into too much detail in the story so we can spend a little bit of time talking about the lessons from this, um, the story is that um, 10 of them come back with these really negative kind of evil reports. Hi, Debbie. <laughs> And, um, and uh, sorry, lost my train of thought there for a second. 10 of them come back with evil reports. And what happens is that they kind of turn the whole nation into a very distraught nation. Everybody's very thrown off and is very terrified by this report that they come back with. And in a nutshell, the story is that as a punishment for not trusting Hashem to lead them to the promised land, these 10 spies are killed in a really sort of awful kind of death specifically to do with their mouths and their tongues because of the lush and horror that they spoke about Israel. And the rest of the nation is basically condemned to spend 40 years, one year for every day of the time that the spies were away, collecting this negative information, 40 years um, in the desert that they now have to spend before they get to this place of being worthy to merit being in the Holy Land. And during this time, all of those males would die out leaving the next generation, which was kind of ready for a new education and a new way of facing going into the Holy Land. And, um, and those would be the people who would be worthy of going into the land. Later on in the story, what happens is that there's a group of people who feel very repentant about what happens and they want to go into the land themselves. And they kind of tell um, Moshe their, their plans and Moshe warns them this is not a good idea you don't have Hashem support in going into the land but they decide to kind of like charge into the land anyway to show how passionate and driven they are about kind of getting Israel back and they um, come into the land and they don't meet a very good ending so they, they don't get much blessing either okay so what is the story about now we know that with every story that we have in the Torah the purpose is not just nice fairy tales the purpose is that we are meant to extrapolate lessons out of this that we can integrate into our own lives. Of course, there are the stories about, you know, great and holy people who seem very much not 
like us, who we could say, you know, I could never be like that. How do I be like the others? How do I be like the Imahos? How, you know, who, are, who am I compared to them? But the point of this is that this is lessons for how we're supposed to be. And these are very integratable um, personality traits and character traits and things to grow on and, and learn that can be changed in our own day-to-day -day lives here in 2021. Okay. So uh, the, although there are many commentaries and many different angles on the story, and you know, this obviously has an effect on many years after this, there's a lot of ways to look at the story. So I've chosen to hopefully take three lessons out of the parasha, although there are hundreds that we could take out of this, but three lessons out of the story of what we are meant to learn from this strange story of this mistake of the spies and how do we apply this to our own personal lives other than just a really interesting historical story. And of course, we have to bear in mind at the outset that the people that we're talking about, these Moravian that we're talking about, are not just three or 12 random people that were chosen at a whim. Each one was obviously representing their tribe. So each one was the elite of their tribe. We're talking about great and holy and learned and righteous people. And we need to remember that at the outset because the, the possible misconception of the story is what they did was so wicked and evil, they must have been evil people. And that's not true. Something went amiss, and we'll figure out what that is in a minute. But we're talking about people who were very upstanding people, who had a very good reputation and who Moshe chose on purpose. He had, to some degree, confidence that these were the right people to represent, although there was already an inkling that this wasn't really such a good mission to be heading out on in the first place. But these were the 12 people who he trusts with this job. And so they aren't just 20 old, 12 old people. And we also have to remember that the way that Sadikim are judged and the way that people in this kind of level are judged is a very fine line where we may not look at your average person in quite the same way, like where did they go wrong? So we're looking at a very you know, thin area here of how is a, a greater or more righteous person judged. Okay, so first of all, let's look at um, what goes wrong in the story. What exactly was their mistake? What is the terrible thing that they did? So. In the 40 days that they spent on this mission, they somehow became uh, very negative. They were very despairing and they come back and they spread this despair. But the truth is that we're not 100% clear what it is exactly that they've done that's so wrong. Because what were they asked to do? They were asked to go out, to be there for 40 days and to come back and to report on the land. Now, what they've come back to do is they've come back to report on the land. They're being honest about what they think they've seen. Now, some of the sort of um, some of the uh, controversy on maybe what they did is maybe they had a uh, made an error by sort of giving too much of their own opinion. Maybe they didn't come back and just kind of like relay straight information. Maybe they sewed into that a bit too much of their own attitude and their own feeling towards it. But the truth is, if we're looking for good leaders, don't we want them to kind of integrate that into how we would see things? Do we want them to just come back, come back with black and white facts? Wouldn't it be a good thing for them to say, I think this is how you'll feel about it, or this, you know, to make it a little bit sort of emotional and not just report things. And we know that they were chosen for this job because they, you know, the, in fact, the fact that people were sent into the land was kind of an indicator that once you go into this land, you're not going to be living in a way anymore, which is just in the hands of Hashem. You're going to have to have like leaders like this, which you can trust in. So surely this is what a leader is supposed to come back and do. So it tells us, the, the Malbim actually tells us, it says there are two kinds of spies. There are two types of spies, and each one has a very distinct mission. And where we get in trouble is we start mixing up the missions of these two different spies. Who are these spies? So the first kind of spy, which we maybe are quite familiar with today, although we don't necessarily refer to this in this terminology, but is probably somebody who's contemplating making Aliyah. Okay, somebody who wants to go and see Israel for the purpose of living in Israel, right? So how do you go to the land when you're going with a vision of, I'd like to bring my family here and I'd like to live in Israel? How do you go there? You go into Israel and you look for what are the job prospects? What are the educational opportunities? What's the housing like? What are, you know, how am I going to make money, et cetera, et cetera. And for this kind of mission, when you enter the place spying in this way, right, then there's a lot of fanfare. You actually want to talk to as many people as you possibly can. You want to get lots of people's opinions. You want to meet the locals. You want to speak to other people who've done this. You really want to kind of like 
count out what people think about this, you're not keeping it low key. You actually would like to expose this to as many people as possible to really get a lot of different opinions. And the more people who kind of join this, the more likely it is that you'll be able to reap the benefit. So in this way of spying, the reason you're doing that is because you would like to move to this place. And so you're trying to find the most amount of positivity that you can in order to make this move. That's the first kind of spy. The second kind of spy is what we'd call like a military spy. And a military spy's job is to search for ways to conquer a land. That's the mission before even going into the land. How are you going to conquer this land? So what are you looking for when you go into land and you want to conquer the land? Then you're going to start looking for ways to find weaknesses in the land, to try to exploit the weaknesses of the land. What are the people like? Where's their weak spots? That's what you go in looking for. And you, you actually, when you go in on a mission like that, you try and seek to avoid people as much as possible. You keep it very low key and quiet and you don't want anybody to know about it because this is a military operation. So what is the tragedy of the story of the Maraglim? And one of the ways that we can look at this, where did they go wrong? Is they mixed up this, these two very different missions. These would be two very different ways of going into a land. How were they sent into the land? What were they commanded to do? You know, when we refer to them as the Maraglim, as the spies, that's not how they refer to it as the, at the beginning of the story. They aren't sent in to go and spy out the land. The words that it uses is it says, Latur et Haaretz which we would say the word tourist to tour, right? To go in like tourists, go into the land, like you're going to make Aliyah and check it out. Come back and tell us. And Moshe says, you know, this is going to be the land of milk and honey. Come tell us, what are the people like? Bring some fruit back so we can see what it looks like. What's the land going to be like? And in fact, the reason that one representative is sent from every single tribe is because every tribe, because of their job and their abilities and their capabilities, is looking for something different in the land. Each one of them needs the land to be something else. It needs to have agricultural uh, uh, possibilities. It needs to have economic possibilities. It needs to have a spiritual perspective. All of them are looking for something different, but they're supposed to be looking at it. It's Latour, like how are you going to settle in this land? How are you going to make this good? How are you going to be coming to this land like tourists and find the, the good stuff in this? And they misunderstood this as being like military spies, that they had to come into the land and seek out its weaknesses and seek out how we're going to conquer this land. And, we, and as we said, nowhere in the story they refer to Miraglim until afterwards when we talk to them. So really when Moshe sends them, his instructions relate to things to do with the environment and health and agriculture. That's what they're supposed to be looking to. He says, go up into the Negev, into the hill country, see what kind of country it is. Are the people who dwell there strong or weak? Are there few or many? Is the country good or bad? Are the towns they live in open or fortified? Is the soil rich or poor? They're looking for all sorts of things. It's like, how are we gonna settle a lot of people in this land. How are we going to settle a whole nation into this land? What prospects exist here for us? Um, and, and then take pains to bring back some of the fruit from the land. So Moshe picked for this job, he picked great spiritual leaders. He didn't pick great military leaders. That wasn't their job. These were not the right people for that kind of job. And that's why they weren't sent on that kind of job. And so they misunderstood their mission. And in a minute, we'll look deeper into what misunderstood that mission means. Let's just look at this from this perspective. They misunderstood why they were being sent. Spiritual leaders were meant to go in there to tour the land, to find the goodness in the land, to find how they were going to make a life for a nation there and come back and report that. But they misunderstood what their job was. And it was Yeshua, in fact, who 40 years later sends these two unnamed, now here it refers to them as Miraglim, go inside there and spy. Here they're named as Lachfor et Haaretz, to go out and like dig the land, go digging, go see what you can find, and to gather intelligence then for an upcoming conquest. They've been sent for something different. And in fact, the words of this says, the way it describes it, because it describes it totally differently, is it says, Yeshua ben Nun secretly sent two spies from Shittim, saying, scout out the land and the area of Yericho, and the two men returned and they told Yeshua concerning what had happened to them. This is a very covert mission. It was very low key, not going in like all these 12, you know, go in there, get to know the people. This was a very, this was clear that this was like military spies and they had a different kind of job. So tragically, those who were sent in to Latour and see the beauty of the land became Muraglim and they saw the challenges and the military challenges of the land. And they came back very disconcerted and they came back very negative. 
So as important as sending Miragli might be to settle in a land, to send in the military, that's a different role. And one of the messages in here is that conquering the land of Israel, settling in the land of Israel needed many different things. It needed physical strength, it needed spiritual strength, it needed lots of things. But we know that, you know, as a, as a Jewish people, and I think as we've stepped recently out of Shavuos, even though this doesn't seem so recent, right? We came out of a place where we spoke about the fact that we as a Jewish people had never been more unified. And what was that unity? What we know, we spoke about camping outside the mountain and we said it says, Vayichan, that we camped as if it was one person, even though it was a whole nation, because we were in such a unified place. Part of that unity was understanding that every single person has a different role and a different job. When we all understand our job, then we can come together as one unit. And here is where that went like off, you know, off target, where they misunderstood what their role was. That was somebody else's job. Being Muraglim was somebody else's job. That wasn't what they were there to do. They were there to be spiritual leaders who went into the land and extracted that out of the land and brought that message back. And, uh, and that's where the mistake happened. So it says when Moshe told them that the land was good, he told them it's flowing with milk and honey. But He'd never seen the land before, right? Moshe was telling them out of what he knew Hashem had told him. But the truth is, Moshe had never been there before. He didn't know the land. So the people were a bit skeptical. They were like, well, how do you know? You telling us that we are going to go settle in this land, which is full of, but we would like somebody to actually see that and report back to us that that's true. So that's what they wanted this mission for. And in fact, when they came back, they said, it's true. This land is a land of milk and honey. But, but, but. But they did see that. They did verify that that was true. And in that way, they fulfilled their mission, but then they kind of deviated from their mission. They said, the land you're sending us to is flowing with milk and honey, and here's the fruit that we've brought back. But like, look how huge this fruit is, and there's giants, and they saw us like grasshoppers, and it's so scary, and we're so weak, and this conquest is going to be impossible. And from that place, tragedy was inevitable. From this space of coming back in the wrong headspace, this is where tragedy was inevitable. What was the difference between them and Kalev and Yeshua? The two the two spies who reported in a positive way, not necessarily that they had a higher level of faith or a higher connection, but they understood their job. They understood what they were sent there to do and they followed through on what Hashem commanded them. They followed through on what they were commanded to do and they did the right thing. These are the two who fulfilled the mission. They did what was requested of them. So we're not talking about evil people. We're talking about the wrong people for the right job. They did, the, they did the wrong thing. They went in there and did the wrong thing. And Caleb and Yeshua came and did the right thing. So to start off with, one of the many lessons that I think we can extrapolate from this is that we, we, all, we have this challenge of each one of us having been sent into the world with our own unique talents and abilities. And those are never really come to fruition until we recognize what we have to bring into the world and what Hashem sent us uniquely down into the world for that nobody else can do right? So part of our task in this world is to recognize that and then to use it. So that means being given the right tools and doing the right job with the right tools, because really tragic things can come from that place where we misunderstand that. And particularly, obviously, we're talking about people who are on such a high level that greatness was expected of them. And they did, and they made the wrong, you know, they did the wrong job. And from our own perspective, in terms of our relationship with that holy land, also that we should merit that we are able to latour at Haaretz, to be able to see the land from that place, to find the goodness and look for the goodness, even though there's difficult things and even though there's challenges. And for you, those of you who've been there and those of you who live there could tell us much more than I could, but you know, not to, 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 be, to approach it like a tourist, not a spy. That's our, that is our, meant to be our relationship with Eretz Israel. So that is <laughs> lesson number one that we're going to pull out of that. Um, sorry. Okay. Now, proceeding, moving on from that. When we look at the, um, the wording or the way that Moshe describes that, um, that the spies are supposed to go in, it talks about the fact, it says the words, see what the land is like. Go and see what the land is like. So we've already said that doesn't tell you to go spy, that tells you to go tour the land, go see what you can see. Now, we've already said that it's a common misconception that they were spies and they were just supposed to kind of go and observe. So Moshe sends them to the land. What does he mean when he says to see? So on a deeper level, not just observe and return and say what you observed, there's something deep in this. Because again, we're talking about highly spiritual and powerful people. What power did they have? What spiritual power did these people have? 
So it says not only they could have gone in there and not only seen for themselves the goodness of the land, but through their seeing and through the way they chose to see the land, they could bring a positive elevation to the land. In other words, in the way that they chose to see it, that could actually have an effect on the land. Their positive vision of the land could actually sort of like uplift the land. And in that way, by observing it in that way and bringing it up in that way, they could sort of like acquire it and they would be able to, it would become theirs and they could transform it into a holy land. In other words, through their positive vision, it could become theirs. And through taking that kind of connection and ownership, that's how they would have been able to overcome it and conquer it and transform it into their own land. But we said they failed their mission and they return with this negative response. And what's part of their negative response is they say, we saw there the giants and we were in our own eyes as grasshoppers. And so were we in their eyes. Now, how did they have any idea how they were in their eyes? Did they interview and how do you see us? They had no idea. How did they get that impression that they were seen as grasshoppers in their eyes? Because that, that's what they were looking for. Does this experience sometimes actually happen to us in real life? That you already know like how somebody sees you and views you before you've even given them a chance to open their mouth. You've already decided. I, I read a story, so I don't remember all the details of this, but about somebody who is standing at the foot of a mountain and he wants to go um, borrow an axe from his friend who lives at the top of the mountain. And as he's dragging himself up the mountain, he's saying like, oh, but why would he want to lend me the axe? And, you know, maybe he needs the axe. And, you know, I'm like coming all the way from wherever. Why does he want to lend it to me? And he builds himself into such a state that by the time he knocks on the door and the man answers the door and says, well, yes, what can I do for you? He says, like, I don't need you and your axe anyway. And he slams the door. And the man behind the door has no idea what he's even talking about, right? Because he's worked himself up into such of a frenzy of you look at me as a grasshopper, right? That the man hasn't even had a chance to open his mouth. So how did they know that the people of the land looked at them like grasshoppers? They didn't. That's the impression that they went in with when they started the mission. They were in this negative headspace before they got there. So they had no real way of knowing how they were perceived in the eyes of the natives. But since in their own view, they were unfit and not ready to enter the land, they therefore assumed that there was the reality, that the natives were giants and they were just grasshoppers. They were looking from a perspective of negativity. They didn't want to, they didn't desire to enter the land, which we'll talk about in a minute. Why didn't they enter to desire the land really on a deep level? We'll get to that. And therefore, the land was negative and impossible to inhabit. And the people saw them badly and there was nothing positive there because they went in there in that headspace. So what does that mean in real life beyond the story? Is that we don't see the things the way they are. Often we see things the way we are. You can walk into any situation and a lot of the time that situation unfolds has got a lot to do with the way you think you are in that situation, how you are being perceived in that situation. So the 10 spies were pessimistic about entering the land of Israel in the first place. They had other motives. They wanted to remain spiritually sheltered. We'll talk about that in the desert and led by Moshe. They went in with a negative perspective. They didn't really want this to work. And so they created a negative reality because of the way that they looked at things. And in contrast, Yeshua and Kalev, they understood their job. They understood the inherent benefit of, of um, inhabiting the land. And they appreciated that it was going to be a gift. It was going to be a gift that Hashem was giving them. And they were passionate and excited about Israel and about inhabiting Israel. And so even though they didn't go into the land and see different things, Caleb and Yeshua didn't view, see different things in front of their eyes than the other 10 spies did. But the way they viewed it was different. Their perspective was different. And that's what changed the way they came back and reported. When they saw this land, what they saw was we should go up and we should take possession of the land. We can definitely do it. We're passionate. We want to do, be there and we're going to make it happen. That was their view. Not because of the reality that they saw that was different. They created a reality in which they truly would have been able to conquer. And in fact, Yeshua, who was the scout who saw the land in a positive light, he was the one who was eventually empowered to really lead the nation back into that land because of the way that he viewed things. Yes, we can do this. Of course we can do this. So that means on a lot of levels, often we can choose the things that we see. There are so many situations that we can walk into that we need to check in with ourselves before we enter that situation. 
how do I choose to see this? Because how I choose to see this is going to often affect the outcome of what's going to happen at the end of the situation. If we understood how deeply what we see is a reflection of who we are and what we're choosing to perceive, then that means we have a choice to perceive things in a positive and uplifting way. Of course, we're not in charge of the outcome of things. We are only in charge of our response to things, but that response is changeable. And that is choosing how to perceive things. So we have to be careful how we view things. We have to be careful how we interpret things because our very seeing of something can affect the quality of that thing, can change the quality of the thing we're seeing. And we should be conscious when a person sees something deeply, it becomes a part of him. And thereby we can choose to create a better reality for ourselves. And sometimes we're seeing things that we shouldn't see. We have to choose also what we see and not just how we see it. So if we immediately see something in life as negative, then we are in charge of going back into ourselves and refracting that light differently, to choose to see it differently, to understand the power of how our vision can change the reality of something that the Jewish people were not allowed to inhabit that land for another 40 years because of the vision they chose to go in with, because of negative vision. When we view a person or a place or an event or an experience with a positive light, we can create a positive kind of energy which actually has the power to change that event or that person or that place or that thing in a very real and deep way. So when we change the way we look at things, the things we look at change. And that is the second lesson that I want to take out of this experience of the Miraglim that really does appeal, apply to us on a very day-to-day -day level in terms of how we approach our own lives. Now, you know, we've said these were great people. They misunderstood their task. But why is it that they wanted to go into the land or approach this experience from such a negative perspective? Why? I mean, Hashem had brought them through so many miracles until this point. If Hashem could get them through everything they got through until now, of course Hashem could get them to this place and conquer the land and help them settle in the land of Israel. They've just been through coming out of Mitzrayim and everything that was included in Mitzrayim. They've been given the, like, what could they, what can Hashem possibly show them after that? That's a more outright miracle. Like, of course Hashem is going to save you. Why were they going in so doubtful and so negative and so afraid that they chose from the outset to see this in a bad light? So, of course, because we, want to, because we want to understand them in a better light and we don't, you know, we're not seeing them as evil people. What was their deep intention here? Why were they negative about this? So various commentaries tell us the idea that, in fact, these spies and as representatives of the rest of the people, but really sort of like the cream of the crop, they really wanted to stay in the desert. They didn't want to go into Israel. What a strange thing. You know, if we imagine walking through the desert, they've come out of Mitzrayim. Like, shouldn't the prize be, isn't the prize at the end of this to walk into Eretz Israel? Like, what more could you possibly want? Why would they want to stay in the desert? So it describes the desert. It says, not because of the beautiful scenery and not because, you know, of the aesthetics of this experience, but because life in the desert was a very spiritually lofty experience. It was a very high spiritual experience. In the desert, Hashem provided food and shelter and protection. And every earthly need that they had was miraculously taken care of. And therefore, because they had no physical concerns, their only concern was to focus all of their efforts on soaring higher and higher and closer and closer to Hashem. That was their only job. Every physical need that they possibly could have ever had was taken care of. So for the nation in the desert, entering the land of Israel, where they were going to have to get a little bit real, it wasn't going to be like this anymore. Hashem wasn't going to send down man and send down quails and send down whatever you request is going to land on the floor. It's going to be different. This concept for them was a little bit like the neshama descending into the body. The soul coming from up on high, from a lofty place, sitting under Hashem's throne, having to come into a body having to come into a physical world, it seemed almost like a, like a yerida, like a spiritual decrease. So when they were here in this place in the desert, what lay ahead of them, what stepping into Israel really meant 
was that this was going to be a life of toil and work and challenge and pain and struggles. It was going to be real life. Stepping into the land of Israel was going to be real life in the real world. And it requires a lot of effort to survive and to make it. And that was very scary. That's not the life that they had been living until now. And it requires work on many different levels. And again, for those of you living in Israel, you can testify to this, right? It requires effort on a physical level just to survive and keep going. It also requires work on one's midas and one's character, particularly if you're not like naturally Israeli and you have to, you know, learn to live with certain ways of doing things, right? That it requires one working on oneself as well and one's character and one's derech eretz. And derech eretz means interacting with the world around you, not living in a lofty place of interacting with integrity and honesty and discipline. In the desert, none of these concepts existed. They didn't have to worry about any of this. So for the spies, entering the land of Israel was equal to sinning in a way. It seemed like such a spiritual decline. Why would they put themselves into that place? It would be like purposely choosing to de degrade the soul. That's what it felt like to them. It's like a regression. It doesn't seem like progress. Now, for us, looking at this concept of being given the gift of settling in Israel, how can you look at it like that? And how, especially leaving the desert? But if we understand the kind of life they were living in the desert, Israel didn't necessarily seem like a gift at that point. It seemed like some kind of spiritual decrease. And as a result, they were almost kind of like repulsed by this idea. So even though it says Israel is Eretz Chemda, this beloved land, it didn't feel like that to them. The most precious of all lands, they disparaged it. They didn't really want to live that kind of physical life. And they talk about it, they said, a land that devours its inhabitants. What did they mean when they said that? It means a land that would swallow up the people in physicality and overwhelm them from a spiritual sense. That they'd be too drawn into this physical need that they wouldn't be able to focus on their spiritual needs anymore. That was scary for them. But where is their mistake there? Because that sounds very lofty and holy and beautiful. Well, then you get it. Why would you want to enter? You know, if you wanted to live in this state of deep, constant connection to Hashem, so of course it was painful for them. But they made a mistake. What was their mistake? So when we say they misunderstood their job, so on a deeper level, what does it mean they misunderstood their job? Their mistake was rooted in thinking that godliness and that holiness and that spirituality lives in the sky that it's all about not in the physical world, that it's in this kind of like rarefied air of the higher dimensions. That's where Hashem lives, right? And they thought that in this world, this world of everyday physical need and toil and work and challenge, that they would never be able to live an elevated spiritual existence. And in that way, they were correct to some degree. They were a little bit correct about that. In the same way as we said, it felt like an ashama coming into a body. It feels like an ashama descending to earth. And that seems painful. So it's true. When birth happens, when a soul comes into the world, the soul descends from this realm of pure spirituality, hanging out with Hashem, right? And it has to come down into this earthly world and deal with its earthly needs and its earthly urges. But at the same time, and it's true that there's something that's that's kind of seems almost spiritually repulsive from that perspective of forcing an innocent neshama into the confines of like a physical world so like what an awful cruel thing to do right and you could look at a soul in this world as if it's like a caged bird that can't express itself and that really just wants to be a soul where once it could kind of like soar just with Hashem and not be encumbered by this physical world but there's a deeper truth which is that being involved in this physical world is the only place that offers opportunities for growth and through that challenge to becoming who we're really supposed to be. So that's why, from a Jewish perspective, it's not considered ultimate holiness to go and sit on a mountaintop somewhere in Tibet, meditating and not speaking to human beings. That is not called spiritual holiness. You know why? Because until you've had to deal with a mother-in-law, a child, an employee, an employee, until you've had to deal with human beings, that's the space where you rectify your character. That's the space where you become who you're supposed to become. Sitting on a mountain in the middle of nowhere, it's lovely that you can commune with God all day long, but you're not really, there's no challenge there. It is exactly the challenges of this physical world that brings a person to their perfection. That is the point that Hashem put us here on purpose. 
And it's a misunderstanding to think that we are deprived of that by being put into a physical body. And more than that, is that when one chooses to live a godly life, because it's a choice in this world, as a soul, there's nothing else you can be. You're just a soul. When you're living as a physical body, there's a lot of choices. So every time you access the soul part of you, you're winning because you're making that choice. And when you choose to live a godly life and to live as one with God and to uplift and inspire other people and to breathe spirituality into an otherwise very mundane existence, then you are, in fact, upgrading the spiritual world. That is, in fact, a higher level because there's challenge there and there's moral choice there. And every day is a different battle on that front. So that's, that is the ultimate challenge. And in the higher world that we're talking about, it's true that souls bask in Hashem's presence. But in this world, the job is for the soul and the body to get together and find their balance. That's the real task. And that's where we become really us. That's where we become all those talents that Hashem sent us down to the world with that we're supposed to recognize, like we said, the Miraglim, recognize what you were given and what your mission is. You can only complete that in partnership with your body. You could never do that just as a soul. It's only when you act that out in the world that you really come to completion. And when we do that, then what we become is co-creators with Hashem. We're bringing godliness into the world. We, become, we have an ability to be godly when we use our soul within our body. And that's what brings us to completion. And that's what brings us to fulfillment. And that's what the essence of entering Israel was all about, which they misunderstood. That's where they went wrong. And just and, and as addition to that, and I think this is very timely now in terms of where we find ourselves as a Jewish people, is that we know that also what we are commanded as a Jewish people is to be a light unto the nations. That's our job. You know, the minute we were given a place to be, a land to be in, we became a nation like every other nation. You're a nation and you have a land. But we are commanded to be a nation unlike any other nation. That's our job. Not like every nation, unlike every nation. And it's true that right now, anti-Semitism is rearing its ugly head like it has many times in history and like it unfortunately will, please God, not too many times because Mashiach is coming soon, but it's going to keep doing that because it historically has always done that. And it's not going to go away because it's sewn into the fabric of who we are and partially strengthens us in who we are, actually. But it's so neat. And, and of course, our responsibility is to spread knowledge and to, but, you know, don't be under the illusion that if you spread, you know, we'd, be, we'd get rid of all the anti-Semitism because we wouldn't. And our job really in all of this is to be a light unto the nations, to not get down there where, you know, to not go down there, to bring everybody else up with us, to shine a light. That's our job. And you can only do that as a soul in this world, in a body. And the ones who made the opposite mistake of that was this group of people who at the end of all of this decided that they felt bad and they were going to take into their own hands coming into the land again. We were grateful and we wanted to approach the land. And Moshe says, no, you'll not be supported by Shem if you do that. Don't do that. You won't find, a, that won't be a good thing for you to do. And these ones, they called the mafilim, the insistence, the insisters. What's their mistake that they make? So they also see two distinct different worlds the world of God and the world of us. But what's their mistake? They say there's God's world and there's man's world. So what that meant for them was we see Hashem up there and us down here. And that the two don't really affect each other. So if we want to go into Israel by our own might and our own strength, we'll get into Israel. And that doesn't work either. The two mistakes here are you can't reside in the heavens and you can't reside too much in the earth either. Our challenge and our job and our lesson from here is merging the two, living a godly life in this world, being a light unto the nations, bringing Hashem into everything we do, remembering that true loftiness and true spirituality is living in this physical world and constantly upgrading and uplifting everything around us to make it holy. Because that's our constant opportunity every day is to turn the ordinary into the extraordinary, to turn the neutral into the holy. That is our opportunity and that's our job. And if those three lessons can be applied to our own personal lives, to know our role and to know our job and to not make a mistake about what our capabilities and abilities are and to really use them and bring them into the world and to see things in a positive light and to know that we can affect the world around us by the way that we choose to see things and that the merging of the upper world and the lower world in that balanced place of body and soul is really our job in this world and to bring light into the world. If we could bring any of those three into fruition, then I think each one of us could find a way to 
change the world around us and to really, as 23rd of seven ends, to switch things around and to bring peace and to bring goodness and to bring joy and to bring repair into the world. So thank you very, very much. Amen, amen. Really, really beautiful and, and really so pertinent to now. And um, I did actually get to make my challah to be my fresh challah. So um, just put it to rise. I'm going to take it out so that we can make a bracha together. But it, it is really incredible. And Ara, thank you. That was really beautiful. Uh, one of the incredible things that we see is actually that Rabbi Tversky, this is where he, he brings down the idea of low self-esteem. And, you know, and where we, where we need so desperately to actually see ourselves as actually being worthy of Eretz Yisrael. We, we need to see ourselves as being worthy um, of Mashiach. And if we really all put our forces together and put ourselves into a place of recognizing that we, we deserve Mashiach, you know, it's, it's like it's enough already. When we look at all that goes on and, and we, you know, you come from Aristotle and I can tell you that you land in London, it's not like landing in Aristotle with whatever it is and wherever it is that's going, you stand and you just breathe the air, the, the sunsets are just, you know, over your shalim are just so magnificent and, and everything about it is just on, on a different kind of level. But I think that we have to really be able to see ourselves. And, and I, I really believe that, you know, we have, we have the opportunity and, and we need to take it and really with both hands and make sure that we do this really together. Um, and it was really very special and beautiful. And, and I think that we also need to remind ourselves so often of bringing, you know, we bring Hashem into our worlds. We, we don't want to, that, that separateness as you so beautifully spoke about, is that the more that we can bring Hashem into our homes and into our worlds, wherever we are, you know, um, is, is something that can really keep us, keep us going.